Okay, now that I have my data set set up, I'm ready to start training something for multi-class logistic regression. Now, let me briefly review the architecture. I, I talked about the building blocks last time, but, but I want to now draw a picture to, to depict what they are. So let's, let's suppose that we had um, some different inputs here. So maybe I'll say this, this is x0 and then x1. So, so my inputs are multi-dimensional inputs. They have different dimensions. Let's say that they have maybe up to dimension d minus one or something. All right, so, so they have d dimensions. So here are my inputs dimensions. And then they're going to be fed to this linear layer, which has as many, you could call them neurons, they're, but they're just linear units. Um, so we have all our, all our little inputs here. And then we have as many linear layers as there are classes. So, so over here we have, you know, D input dimensions. And then here maybe I'll say that we have um, maybe N classes. And so we're going to have a little neuron for each of these is, is one way to think about it. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna feed each one of these input dimensions to each one of these neurons. And so here I'll, I'll say, okay, um, each one of these has a weight. So I'll call this weight W00. So this is into, maybe I'll call it class zero or C0 for class zero. Um, there's gonna be another linear unit for class one. There's gonna be another linear unit for class two and so on and so forth. And so just looking at all the weights coming into the first class, um, I'll call that one W00, I'll call the other one W01, and then all the way down here, I'll call this one W0 D minus one. And then there's going to be a bias also. I'll call it B0 for bias zero coming into this. And so the output of this is going to be the dot product of the inputs with the weights going into it plus the bias. So, so the, the output here would be x0 times w0 plus x1 times w01 plus dot 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 plus x d minus one times w0 d minus one plus the bias. So that, that would be the output coming out of here. And, and you'll have similar things for, let me just make a little space here. You, you'll have similar things going into the other um, intermediate neurons here. So, so there's going to be one for each class. So for our digits, there are going to be 10 of these in this middle layer here. And um, there's going to be an input from each of my input dimensions with, with, with those weights. So, so I'll call this weight W10. So it's, it's the contribution of the zeroth dimension from the input to, to the class at index one. I will call this one W11. This is the contribution of input at dimension one to class one. And then I'll call this one WD1 um, one D minus one. And these are all going to have their own biases as well. So I'll call this bias B1 and I'll call this bias down here um, B2 and, and so on and so forth up to, I guess I'll just remind us that you know, there could be many classes. This is up to class C. I said there are N, capital N classes, so this would be C at minus one. Okay, so there are N units in this intermediate layer here, and they each take um, contributions from all the inputs that I have. Once I finished crunching those through, um, ooh, that's funny, I didn't mean to draw 3D. Uh, <laughs> once I finished crunching those through, I'm going to send them through a softmax. That's what I'm going to do with, with this um, multi-class logistic regression. So I'll send each one of these through a softmax. And then I'm going to output the same number of dimensions there. So if I inputted three dimensions, or if I inputted n dimensions to the softmax, then I should expect an output that also has n dimensions. 
And that's the output that I will then compare to the one hot vector. So this is my full, we would say, architecture here. This is the design of my network. So this is the soft max function. And so that's how you would visually depict what we're about to plug into Torch here. So the last thing I want to remind you is, is that um, it's convenient to organize these weights in a big matrix. So I'm going to find a matrix W where I have um, all the weights for the first class along the first row. So I say W0, 0, W0, 1, W0, 2, ta, 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 W0, D minus 1. And then in the next row, I'm going to have W10, W11, W12, dot, 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 W1, D minus 1, and so on and so forth. W2, W20, blah, 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 blah. Okay? And so, so I'm going to, it's convenient if I arrange the weights into a matrix like this, because then what I can do is if I set up my inputs um, as a column vector. So if, if I go ahead and I take my inputs, um, you know, x0, x1, x2, and I put them all along a column vector here, x0, x1, x2, dot, 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 all the way down to x, d minus one. Um, if I put these in a column vector, then I can describe, I, I can actually very efficiently represent the uh, matrix multiplication as, hang on, I want to flip this horizontal here. Um, whoops, I meant to say object flip horizontal. There we go. I can represent the dot products here that I'm trying to do. So the dot products of the inputs with, with the weights. I can represent those as, as actually just the matrix multiplication. So, so first row here times this is actually just the dot product of, of that. And so, so what I'll do at the end is, is I will sum um, Right next to that, I will sum on the biases that come out. So here it would be, yeah, so once I'm finished doing the dot products and I have the results of those, I will add on my biases in a column vector. This would be B and minus one. So this is what it looks like as a matrix equation. And then this whole thing gets fed to a softmax. So that's that's the picture here. So here's how you see it algebraically. It's just as a matrix equation that gets us to this point. And then actually we crunch this whole thing through a softmax. So what I can do is, is just, I'll say, okay, maybe I'll just draw it here freehand, but this is, this is softmax, it's a big old sigma here. Let me make that look a little nicer, okay. <laughs> so I got my sigma there. And then I have, um, you know, I'm going to feed the result of this to a softmax, is what I'm saying. Okay. And so, so this is the functional algebraic representation of what I'm doing. Um, and just up here, I'm showing the picture of, of what I'm doing. So keeping this in mind, I want to define something in Torch that has all these parameters and, and is able to learn them and, and do gradient descent on them to come up with an optimal set of parameters so that when I input a particular set of pixels, it's going to output something from the softmax that is, is very well in agreement with what that digit should actually be. All right. So first, I'm going to start by defining the weights and the biases in Torch. And so I'm going to say the following. I'm going to say, I guess I'll call it um, linear equals nn dot linear. And so here what I give it is the number of input dimensions. So, so here would be 28 times 28. So that would be 784 pixels. I'm going to have 784 grayscale values. And I'm going to output 10. I'm going to output 10 um, numbers, which I can interpret as log probabilities which then get fed to softmax. And the output of that, we could interpret as the probability of belonging to a class. And ideally, the, the, the probability mass function will be really concentrated on one of these, so we're very confident about one of them. OK, so that's the idea. So here's all the parameters I need. In fact, if I look at this, I say print linear dot parameters. I call this method here. Actually, I need to say, Let's see, so let me put in a list there. Yeah. 
Okay, so I look at this and I see, okay, this linear, this linear layer and torch has two components. One of them is this matrix here, and the other one is what looks like just a, a one-dimensional array. And so in fact, th this is the W matrix I just showed you. And then this is the B matrix of the biases. Notice how this has 10 elements. So actually, let me, let me drill into that a little bit further. So if I say, um, if I look, want to look at the shapes of these, I see that they look like this. Now, just, just to go into it a little bit further, um, yeah, so these, these, are, these are torch tensors. Um, let me maybe just pull out the first row of W and, and, and plot it. So if I were to say pld.imshow w0.view2828, I look at it, and it doesn't let me do that. What does it say? Uh, oh, okay, right. So, so I, what I've done here is I've set up, um, so these tensors, actually one thing you notice when you print them out, so if I print this out again, so these, these are torch, actually the weights are torch tensors. When I print this out, notice it says requires grad equals true. What that means is all of these parameters are things that I want to be able to learn. So I need to be able to take the derivative of some loss function that I'm about to define with respect to these parameters. And so it turns out I can't, I, I actually have to detach them first. I have to take them out of gradient mode if I want to plot them. So I have to say W, I'll slice that out and I'll say detach. And now it'll let me look at it. So here are the weights that, that I start off with for, for digit um, zero, for, for the zero class. That's like all these weights coming in, into here. And you see they're, they're, they're random. So, so actually torch randomly initializes. It'll look a little bit different this time, it'll look a little bit different this time. Um, torch randomly initializes the weights and the biases. Okay. Um, in, in your homework um, for doing uh, gradient descent for logistic regression, for the move reviews, I tell you just to initialize them at zero. But it's, it's more common to, to randomly initialize the weights. All right, so that's how we're starting off here. Now what we need to do is, is actually train this. So, so now we're going to set up a training loop. to do something called mini bash gradient descent. So what I'll do is um, I want to loop through all of the training data a bunch of times and update the weight and bias parameters via gradient descent. So the number of times that I loop through, I'm going to refer to as an epoch. So I'll say number of epochs, I'll say 50. So let's say 50 epochs. And each, each one of these, I'm going to loop through the data in its entirety. So what I'll do is I'll set up a data loader. And so I'm interested in doing this on the training data. I call that up here. Oh, I guess I haven't, um, oh, that's interesting. I meant to call this training before. That was, that was the, um, in the digits folder. So let me just update that real quick. Uh, but then also I'm going to load the testing data, which I'll get to in a moment. That is in the folder that I called digits test. So just to have a look at this. Let's make sure the links are right. This should uh, the training should have sixty thousand. I forget exactly how many of the testing should have. Um, that's not quite right. Let's see testing. I didn't think it had that many examples. Let me just check this real quick. Okay, so the mistake I made was a similar mistake to what I made in class, which is that um, this here needs to be self.digits. Somehow the digits were in global sp scope from the training, I think, from the first time I loaded it. In fact, if I restart and clear output, I'll, I'll make sure that that's not the case anymore. So yeah, I wanted to use the actual instance variable that's a member of this class, which will be different for, for the test set um, and the training set. Now we look at these and I see there's actually only 10,000 testing examples. Okay, cool. Great. 
And so anyway, just this was another example of a bash. I was going through all the batches here and showing you, okay. But now I'm gonna do that down here. And so, so what I'm actually going to need to do is, so I have these parameters, but I also need to define something to help me do gradient descent. So I'm going to write here um, torch.opt.atom and I'll pass to it um, linear.parameters and I can specify a learning rate. So Adam stands for adaptive moment type gradient descent. So, so it does some, some fancy thing to improve gradient descent. We, we won't worry about it for now. But basically this, this is a module that's going to, to perform gradient descent on our parameters. Okay, we're also going to find a loss function. And in fact, um, torch has binary cross entropy loss already. So, so I'm going to use that. So I say torch.nn.bce with logits loss. So this is a function that I can use f to do cross entropy loss. Binary cross entropy loss. Um, in fact, it, 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 you know, so one way I could set up this architecture in practice is I could follow this by a softmax. The softmax is in torch already. I could say torch dot softmax. I need one, two, three. Oh, it didn't like that. Uh, I need to make it a tensor. Still didn't like that. Uh, oh, I have to tell it the dimension I'm doing the softmax across. And it doesn't like that. Um, let me say, I <laughs> make these floats. <laughs> I was just trying to do a quick example here. Okay, anyway, so, so Torch has softmax. You see there, there this thing gets, gets the maximum. And I could do that. I could say, okay, you know, the first thing I'm gonna do here is if, if I take a, one of the things out of, out of the batch here. So, so if I were to do this here, if I were to take a batch out, I could actually say y s the mesh is equal to um, linear, so that that was this layer, which is the matrix multiplication plus the bias. I could say y estimate is equal to linear of x, and if I look at that, um, that actually is going to output a 16 by 10 vector, which is what would happen if if you did a multiplication by um, of a bunch of examples. So, 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 you know, the first column here would be the first example, the second column would be the second example. Um, that's what you would get if you did the matrix multiplication of, of W times a bunch of examples plus, plus the biases broadcasted across them. In other words, what, what I should be getting here is, is what, what would be the input to the softmax. So if I print this out, um, each one of these would be the input to the softmax. And then I'm supposed to perform the softmax on each one of those. So, so I would actually really, uh, it's like I would say y estimate is equal to torch.softmax y estimate along dimension one. So I'm performing the softmax al along each of these, along dimension one here. Th that's what the network should actually be doing. And just to check if, if I do the sum, torch.sum y est dim equals one. Um, they all sum to one, like the softmax should. So that was just a sanity check there. So this is truly, in, in, in Torch, um, what our network does here. It's, it's this linear layer plus the bias followed by softmax. But eventually we know we're going to be using the binary cross entropy loss that are defined here. And so, you know, if when I do the softmax, I'm taking the exponent, dividing it by the sum of the exponents, and I'm about to take a log again. Well, well this is a really bad idea, numerically because the exponent can really blow things up. I could actually end up overflowing. Um, and now I'm about to see the log again. And, and also I know that if I'm using the binary cross entropy loss on this, that I'm gonna get a really nice, even though the derivation was a little bit messy, um, a very nice update rule. So I'm actually, there, there's something in, in Torch, which I'm gonna have you do a similar thing um, yourself when you implement neural networks from scratch in the next assignment. Um, Torch allows us to skip taking the softmax. And, and we can have a loss function that, that directly cuts from the linear output to um, the binary cross entropy update rules. Okay. 
So, so this was to show you how to apply the, 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 that linear layer to a whole bunch of examples and to say, I don't actually need to do the softmax straight up because I know I'm gonna use the binary cross entropy loss. It's better if I just cut to the chase and, and know that I have these simple update rules if I'm doing that. I, I should not have to actually explicitly take the softmax in order to do gradient descent because it's gonna turn out really simple. All right, so that's that. So let's go ahead and, and do um, this mini batch gradient descent here. So what I'm gonna do is, is every epoch, I'm going to start over again with a new partition of my training data set into batches. Uh, so I'll say batch, let's say batch size is equal to 32. I may even make it a little bit bigger. I'll say 64 here. Um, so conventional wisdom says, okay, you can use a bigger batch if your data is a little bit more complicated. Um, the advantage to using smaller batches is I'll take more steps, okay? Because what I'm gonna do is, is each batch, I'm going to take a step. So let me just finish this up and you'll see what I mean. Okay, so what I'll say now is 4xy in loader. So I'll go through each batch. And what I'll do is I will do exactly this. So I will put my all my examples through the network. And now what I'll do is I'll compare those examples to what, what I should be getting. So this, these are my one hot vectors that are coming out here. This is, this is going to be you know, right before softmax. And, and this loss function is designed to say, okay, um, if I say loss function of ys, let me check, double check the documentation here. It should be, um, okay, the input and then the target. So, so this is, y estimate is what, what I, this comes out of my network and I wanna compare this, the softmax of that to these one hot vectors. And so this is how I write it. Now, now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, okay, um, I want to compute the gradients of the loss function with respect um, to all parameters in the optimizer. So I'm going to say loss dot backward. Now let me just make sure that runs. So it's backward. Oh, Torch has no. Uh, Module opt. Wait, what was it called here? Um, it was called. Wait, did I need to? Um, torch dot optim is what it was called. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so it seems to be running. I'm not crashing yet. So so lost that backward computes the gradient, but then I actually have to apply gradient descent. So based on what these gradients are, I'm actually going to take a step based on the learning rate against the gradient. And, and so that's going to be by saying optimizer.step. And then I'm going to say um, optimizer dot um, zero grad. So I'm going to clear the accumulated gradients for next time. So what's happening here is, is for each batch, um, I'm going to compute sum up the losses for each example. Into this, into this variable here, which I call loss. Then I'm gonna take the gradient of that variable with respect to all the parameters that I'm learning here. And then I'm going to actually apply gradient descent. So, so to take a step against the gradient, the gradient points in the direction of steepest ascent. It tells me how to, you know, how would I most quickly climb up the mountain and increase this function but I want to decrease it, so I'm gonna take a step against the gradient. That's, that's what Adam is going to do here. Um, and maybe Charlie and Sam too. <laughs> I don't know, it's called Adam. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's great. Let me also keep track of the number, let, let me keep track of the loss. So what I'll do maybe is I'll say total loss equals zero. I'll accumulate the loss um, over all batches. So, so yeah, what this reason is called mini batch gradient descent is because we take just a chunk of data at the time, we update the gradients for that chunk of data, um, and then we take a little step. And then we, then we take another chunk of data, we update the gradients, we, we compute the gradients again, we take another step. And we keep doing this um, until we've gone through the entire data set. So every time I get a loss, I'll accumulate that. Um, I have to here say loss oh, item. This this is for kind of a weird reason, but but this says don't keep profit. You know, don't keep 
taking gradients at this point. I just want to know what was the loss. I don't want this function to be the sum of things that are then considered to be differentiable. So anyway, whatever. Tor torch, you, you got to be careful because it automatically wants to take the gradient of anything that's a function of your parameters. When I say loss, that item is just going to take that out and treat it like a float, basically. Okay, another thing I would like to know is um, what is the accuracy? So it's one thing to see the loss, but it's another thing to actually know w w which examples am I getting right here? So I can also look at um, compute the number of examples that are correct. So if I look at my softmax, I, I know that the input to the softmax has the same maximum index as what the softmax output would be. And if it's working properly, you know, I'm going to take, I'm going to consider this to be whatever digit that achieves the maximum softmax in the output. So what I can do is compare. So maybe here I'll say um, num correct. So I will compare the number of, so I'll say maybe um, torch.argmax y estimate um, dim equals one. So I'll look and see, okay, for each output, what was the um, dimension in, actually in this vector, because we haven't put it through softmax yet, but what was the dimension in this vector that achieved the maximum? And let me compare that to the vector um, that achieved the maximum in the one hot vector and what we're aspiring to be. So if these are the same, so I I'll actually should say torch at sum equals equals. So if these are the same, then I'll get credit for getting these correct. So if the maximum of my output is the same as the maximum of the one hot vector, then I'll consider that to be correct. And what I'll do is, is um, you know, once I've finished going through all of the batches, I will remember um, what the total loss was. So I'll say loss is um, epoch is equal to total loss. And I will also remember um, the number of items I got correct. So, so here um, I'm going to say number correct over the total number of items in that data set. So that would be um, over length of training. And let me go ahead and print out here. I'll say epoch or epoch, however you want to say it. Um, epoch whatever. Um, the loss is this. The accuracy is this. So I'll say epoch losses, epoch accuracy, epoch. And I almost certainly have a problem here somewhere. Let's see. <laughs> um, but let me see if this runs. Okay. Oh, I actually didn't seem to not have had a problem. Accuracy of zero, though. That's a little bit uh, suspicious. So let me let me see. And, and also the loss is going up. That's not a good sign. I would like the loss to go down. <laughs> actually, because this is supposed to be getting closer to zero each time. So let me double check this. Um, I said, okay, my optimizer is going to, and let me actually, let me take this down here. Um, I'm going to actually define this over again, down here to make sure that I'm, that I'm defining something new each time. Okay, so I'm optimizing the, the, the new, new, newly randomly initialized linear parameters. Um, I've got this loss function here. I'm doing optimizer.step. I'm doing optimizer.zero grad. And let, let's see what happens here. Okay, so let me just pause a second and, and examine this because this doesn't look quite right. The loss is going up and the accuracy just stays at zero. Okay, actually, I was just being very silly with the, <laughs> the way I printed things here. Um, I, I meant to say, okay, I'm printing out which epoch I'm in. And then I meant to print... Um, well, I meant to say that uh, the accuracy at this epoch or epoch is, is equal to the number correct over length training. Now it should be, if I do this, it'll make more sense what I'm saying. It was working perfectly, but okay. So I start off with a loss of 138, go down to 86, go down to 77. And you can see as, as the loss is going down, the accuracy is going up. And, and that's a very good sign. Um, 
and and I'm moving towards an accuracy of 90 percent and and this is actually about where I don't think I'm going to do too much better than this um, with this architecture but I'll, I'll let it run for a little, little bit longer and we'll see where we end up okay so I do this for a long time and I end up at about um, on the training data a loss of 62 and, and the accuracy is about 92 percent so if I were to plot the losses over time, um, what I call it, that was, yeah, the array losses. So on the X label, I'd say that that's the epoch that we're at, and the Y label is loss. Then we call this a loss curve, and, and we want to see this going down over time. So this is very, very nice. Um, this, this curve goes down over time. But of course, you know, we've looked at these before. It'll depend on the learning rate and things like that. Um, now this, this is how well I was able to do on the training data, but really I want to know how well does this generalize to unseen examples. So I should actually look at this over the test data as well. So I'll do the same kind of thing, but I will just run this through the test data and see where we ended up. So here I'll do a, a data loader on the testing data. Um, I mean, I can make the batch be the whole thing, really. It doesn't matter because I'm not training in this way. Um, so I'll say length of testing. And then I'll just say x, y equals iter or next iter loader. So we can just do this straight up here. And I shouldn't care so much about the loss. What I really want to know is the number I got correct. So what I'll say here is, okay, the number I got correct on the testing set over the, the number of examples in the testing set ends up being pretty good. Okay, this, this, is, this is encouraging because this is actually different. So, so on the training data, I ended at 0.916. And on the testing data, I ended up at 0.915. So basically the same performance. And, and these were different examples. So these were not examples that were ever sent through the training set. So it's encouraging that, 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 it, that it would still work and, and that it would generalize. Now, I don't want us to get too excited because unfortunately, I mean, 92% seems pretty good. But unfortunately, I, I tested this out on um, K nearest neighbors <laughs> uh, using seven neighbors. You know, this is the first thing that we did once we, we vectorized data. And this got almost 97% accuracy. So. Okay, we did all this work and, and now we're getting, um, you know, we're getting 91% accuracy, 92% accuracy. Uh, that's a bit disappointing, but it's still, it's not bad. And also this is, this is a building block for what's to come. So this is kind of the first baby step towards um, general neural networks, which will actually be much more powerful than nearest neighbors in general. All right, so, so that's how you would train it with mini batch gradient descent. And, and then this is how you would, this is what, what, what the loss curve looks like. Actually, for good measure, maybe I'll, I'll also throw in, maybe I'll throw in the accuracy curve as well. Sometimes it's helpful to see what the accuracy is doing over time. Um, we'll, we'll do more of this as, as we move forward, but this is just to begin with. Um, so the accuracy curve, while the loss curve goes down, I want the accuracy to be going up over time as it trains, so that, that's encouraging. And then we see on the training data, or, or sorry, on the test data, um, we still do well. We do well on the test data. So our model that we trained generalizes to unseen examples, and that's, and that's encouraging. Another way we can look at the model and see, uh, you know, maybe build some confidence about what it's doing. I showed you that before the training, um, I don't have this here anymore, but, but you know, before the training, um, I showed you that the parameters were, were random. After the training, if I dig into the parameters, I, I can actually look at them. Let me plot for, for each of the classes here. So I'll say maybe for I in range um, 10, and let me look at, so I'll say here's a subplot four, four, x one. Let me look at um, all the parameters actually. And I will plot each one of them. So let me see plt.title 
i here. So if I look at the parameters, and let me get this crap out of the way. Um, and let's do interpolation equals none. Okay, so I look at this and I see, okay, these are the weights that are applied. So, so basically I take a dot product of my image with each one of these. So what does this mean here? Um, maybe I should throw a little, I should actually throw a color bar on these. Okay, so actually they go, they go a little bit negative. Let me, you know, they go up roughly to one and roughly down to negative one. So, so maybe I'll say, um, I'll say here V min equals negative one, V max equals one. And so actually I'll use a different color map. I'll use the color map, which is red, blue. And so, okay. <clears throat> so blue means a positive weight, red means a negative weight. So if I'm looking for a zero, somehow I use a positive weight inside here, negative weights here. So what is it? What is that saying? Um, I mean, if I go back up here and I look at, let me use a gray color map here. So here, okay, so white is a one, black is a zero. So if I was looking for a zero, I should see a bunch of white in the middle and then some black here. So, so one's in the middle, black, and kind of a ring around it. Okay, and that's what I would see here. I'd say one's in the middle, black, and a ring around it. So, so I'd want to be subtracting off the zeros there. And then, and then some more white in the background. That's the idea. Whereas if I was looking for a one, it would kind of be the opposite. I would say, okay, I want, uh, I know that actually this is supposed to be a zero. So I'm gonna take a negative weight there, um, surrounded by, by white, surrounded by ones. So I'll make sure to give those a positive weight. So anyway, what's interesting is, 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 is this network actually from the examples it kind of learned um, which pixels were supposed to be involved as part of each of these digits and, and which ones weren't. And so you can kind of see, I mean, it's a little bit, <laughs> it gets a little bit hard with some of the digits, but, but you can kind of see what it's learned here. Actually, you might as well look at the bias too. So, so if I were to look at, um, if I were to look at the bias by itself, let's see what that looks like. Um, so if I were to say the bias there, what does that look like? Oh, it doesn't like that. Um, oh, wait, duh, it's not a whole image, it's just 10 things. So I guess in this case, I'm just gonna be plotting um, plotting it. So yeah, I'll just say B dot detach. Yeah, so, okay, this is kind of interesting. So so what what it does actually is is it, it yeah, actually all the biases look like they're negative. So you, you have to overcome this negative stuff with positive stuff to even get above zero here, which is kind of interesting. So, so that's what it's learning with the bias. Anyway, so yeah, I wanted to show you how to drill down into the weights there. I wanted to show you how to do uh, mini batch gradient descent and how, how to check it on the testing data set. And this is kind of the pattern we're gonna follow for everything from now on, even when we go to make fake cats. <laughs> um, this is the pattern. So you can come back to this and look at it again. And if you ever need to review how this, this pipeline works, okay? But, but actually from here on out, the networks are just gonna get a little bit more complicated. So here we really only had one layer, so to speak. Um, just this, really this matrix and the bias. Moving forward, we're gonna have a bunch of layers. But that's really the only difference. The whole pipeline of, of creating the data loader, you know, setting up the training loop, keeping track of the loss and the accuracy, plotting those, you know, testing them on a test set, and maybe digging into some of the parameters. That's always what we're gonna do when we're dealing with, with neural networks and deep learning. All right, so let's let that sink in. And, and then I'm finally going to move towards neural networks.